Thank you very much. And uh, I do appreciate the people drifting in and perhaps sitting down even before they've begun the digestion process. Um, all I can say is that this report is also about the uh, <clears throat> services of nature, including provisioning services, which we've all been enjoying in, in the room next door, downstairs, upstairs. Uh, so I encourage you to take your seats. Uh, my, my brief 15 minutes today is going to be about actually a vast area which has been discussed both in Achim Steiner's excellent, uh, in, excellently intermediated and highly uh, uh, distinguished panel, and in fact through much of today. Uh, the Green Economy Initiative, which is a family of initiatives within the United Nations. I will talk about what they are, what we are trying to do, and perhaps try and pull together some of the threads that uh, I observed uh, through this very fascinating morning. Um, I'm one of those things called a banker. It's, it's not yet extinct. I'm delighted that there's at least one of the species around. I'm off from my bank, Deutsche Bank, for two years working with UNEP whilst I pursue what is actually to me a couple of dream projects, one on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, because that's my uh, personal uh, obsession, and the other is on the green economy, so that's a quick background. Now, the first question is to be asked is, of course, what is a green economy? And uh, uh, sometimes people think, haven't I heard this before? You should have, because Blueprint for a Green Economy, a book by David Pierce, was written as far back as 1989, that's 20 years ago. And there have been any number of great publications on the subject of the ecology, the environment, and the connection with the economy. And I would say that the area, because it is so well written upon, it is actually more of a challenge to bring out what is needed today, what action is required today. So let me begin with defining by saying what a green economy in our understanding is not, and that helps you to understand what is a green economy. Firstly, it is not one that consumes capital. And that goes without saying that if you have a business which destroys its assets, and in addition to not, not recording that destruction, then clearly you do not have a proposition of sustainability. Our ecological footprint, and you heard that mentioned over lunch, our ecological footprint as a society has already surpassed 1.3. And that's almost twice what it was 40 years ago. And that footprint means that we are consuming more ecological uh, production than the Earth has by a factor of 30 or 40 percent. And that's not a green economy because we are consuming capital effectively. The second aspect of what is not a green economy is taking risks which are extreme and therefore risk sustainability. And clearly, with the whole discussion around climate and the fact that we are emitting four or five times as much as the Earth can absorb on an ongoing basis, um, clearly that is a significant risk to be taking. So by both these counts, uh, I would say that our global economy today is not a green economy. Uh, what is our initiative about? It's actually not an initiative. It's truly a, a family of projects that has been spawned at various stages by the G8 plus five, by the United Nations, and by individual governments. Uh, the one that brought me to this uh, table, if you like, is the project called TEEB, which is on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. If you like, it's the uh, equi equivalent in biodiversity and ecosystems of what the Stern Review was, and tries or is trying to make a similar case about early action, and the costs of early action versus the costs of inaction. Uh, the second project was published by the ILO and the UNEP and other collaborating parties some time back called the Green Jobs Report. And the third one, which has just begun, is a Green Economy Report, which will be the main subject of my discussion today, where we are talking about demonstrating that greening is in fact not a drag on growth, but in fact a new engine for growth. That is not a net cost on employment, but in fact a, a source of green new jobs and decent jobs. And most interestingly and most importantly perhaps, that's in fact a better way of taking and taking out poverty on a long-term basis. Solving of persistent poverty has been targeted by the MDGs, but we haven't really got there yet. Leading from these, and because of the current circumstances of the financial crisis and the ensuing recession, we in this family of initiatives were confronted with the need to make a point at this stage, because we cannot be working out of context. And the reality is that the uh, G20 and a few other nations collectively have put together an array of something like two and a half to three trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus. Agreed, we are all Keynesians these days, but the question is to be asked is, what is the future of that stimulus? What is the return that it will truly produce? And what effectively is the future liability that it will generate? So the first question to ask uh, is, 
how sustainable is the growth that ensues post-recession as a result of this? The second reason why I believe we need to rethink how to spend this stimulus, hence the Global Green New Deal, is the whole uh, research around the subject of green investments versus a shopping spree, as I call it. Perhaps the best example of that is by the Center for American Progress, where they analyzed what would be the outcome of 100 billion spent on either renewable and sustainable energy projects and, ret and building retrofits and projects of that nature, or the same 100 billion invested in oil and gas industry, or the same 100 billion actually spent, as in not posted in checks to people, but actually spent in a sh shopping spree, if you like. And the answer was that the, the greening option uh, was going to create 2 million jobs. The, sh the shopping spree would create 1.7 million, but 1.7 million jobs which are paid on average less because of the knowledge content of those jobs. And that the oil and gas uh, investment of the same amount would create 550,000 jobs only, but slightly higher, higher paid because obviously the nature of the, the industry. And the third reason why we should rethink our, our uh, economic uh, strategies these days is the fact that there exist win-win-win, triple-win solutions, and let me describe what that means. We are talking about simultaneously targeting decent job growth and lowering risk and getting a higher return, in other words, higher investment, return on the investment. Um, perhaps the best example of that is a study by the World Resources Institute, which talks about investing a billion dollars where that investment placed into renewable energy arenas would create 30,000 jobs. It would save as a result of partly cost reductions and also partly uh, lower utilization of energy. It would save 450 million over a three year period. And it would obviously save emissions to the extent of 0.6 megatons or 600,000 tons. So you've got a win on lower risk for the, for the world. You've got a win on jobs and you've got a win on cost savings. The fourth reason is about, and why that's, I'm questioning the word global, if you like, and why should it be a global? Uh, I think it has to be global because we are in a connected global economy. Impacts in one point uh, create economic impacts in the other. Um, fewer flowers purchased in, in the shops here in Paris could produce job losses to the farmers in Kenya who would be growing those flowers. So it needs to be global. We cannot follow a beggar thy neighbor philosophy. And lastly, I think uh, uh, perhaps the most point of caution there is that what if we didn't? Because if that 2.8 trillion, which is approximately 4% of global GDP, just gets spent on reinvigorating an ancient model, which clearly has proved its own fa its fallibilities in the recent past, what if we didn't? And what will happen then? What are we doing in terms of additional costs, additional risks, and indeed losing an opportunity to create change given that we have a degree of consensus on the Keynesian approach and the need to inject this additional spending into the economy. I want to say a few words about the very simple, uh, simply worded objectives, if you like, of this Green New Deal that, that we proposed, uh, which was number one being, and the, the immediate one being, to revive the world economy, create new and decent jobs, and to protect the vulnerable. Number two being, if you like, a more medium-term and risk-oriented aspect, which is to reduce the carbon dependency of our economy and to reduce ecosystem degradation and to reduce water scarcity. And the third is, of course, coming back to the MDGs, and 2015 is the due date. Um, I personally believe that we should probably talk 2025 realistically, but the point is we have to help achieve the MDGs. Um, if we just, and this, uh, to this I owe uh, a lot to Ed Barbier, who's uh, been one of the authors of a paper that was published for us. Um, if we just look at these objectives from the point of view of how much of them relate to poverty, it's quite interesting that all of them do. They have a poverty theme within each. We are talking about protecting the vulnerable, whether it's following Bob Zellick's recommendation of a 0.7 uh, allocation of fiscal towards the vulnerable, or whether we are talking about water scarcity, which is the number one problem in most poor countries, or whether we are talking about the MDGs themselves, which are absolutely everything about poverty. So we are actually addressing a lot of issues at the bottom of the economic pyramid. It's an irony that most people think that the bottom of the economic pyramid is, is a phrase invented by uh, an American Indian um, um, professor, but actually this was Franklin D. Roosevelt who first invented this phrase, the same man to whom we owe the original New Deal way back in 1933. 